Welcome to Catholic Light. Join me, Becca Doherty, each week as we shed a little light while keeping the conversation light. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Catholic Light. Thanks for joining me. On today's episode, today's episode will be brief. We'll simply read Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraphs 2196 through 2231. And then I'll return next week to discuss the fourth commandment briefly, honor your mother and your father, and then we'll move into the fifth commandment. So here we go. Chapter two, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to his disciples, love one another even as I have loved you. In response to the question about the first of the commandments, Jesus says, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The apostle St. Paul reminds us of this. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Article 4, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. He was obedient to them. The Lord Jesus Christ himself recalled the force of this commandment of God. The apostle teaches, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. The fourth commandment opens the second table of the Decalogue. It shows us the order of charity. God has willed that after him we should honor our parents, to whom we owe our life and who have have handed on to us the knowledge of God. We are obliged to honor and respect all those whom God, for our good, has vested with his authority. This commandment is expressive in positive terms of duties to be fulfilled. It introduces the subsequent commandments, which are concerned with particular respect for life, marriage, earthly goods, and speech. It constitutes one of the foundations of the social doctrine of the church. The fourth commandment is addressed expressly to children in their relationship to their father and mother, because this relationship is the most universal. It likewise concerns the ties of kinship between members of the extended family. It requires honor, affection, and gratitude toward elders and ancestors. Finally, it extends to the duties of pupils uh, to to, of pupils to teachers, excuse me, employees to employers, subordinates to leaders, citizens to their country, and to those who administer or govern it. This commandment includes and presupposes the duties of parents, instructors, teachers, leaders, magistrates, those who govern, all who exercise authority over others or over a community of persons. Observing the fourth commandment brings its reward. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Respecting this commandment provides, along with spiritual fruits, temporal fruits of peace and prosperity. Conversely, failure to observe it brings great harm to communities and to individuals. The family and God's plan. The nature of the family. The conjugal community is established upon the consent of the spouses. Marriage and the family are ordered to the good of the spouses and to the procreation and education of children. The love of the spouses and the beginning of children create members of the same family personal relationships and primordial responsibilities. A man and a woman united in marriage, together with their children, form a family. This institution is prior to any recognition by public authority, which has an obligation to recognize it. It should be considered the normal reference point by which the different forms of family relationship are to be evaluated. In creating man and woman, God instituted the human family and endowed it with its fundamental constitution. Its members are persons equal in dignity. For the common good of its members and of society, the family necessarily has manifold responsibilities, rights, and duties. The Christian Family The Christian family constitutes a specific revelation and realization of ecclesial communion, and for this reason it can and should be called a domestic church. 
It is a community of faith, hope, and charity. It assumes singular importance in the church, as is evident in the New Testament. The Christian family is a communion of persons, a sign and image of the communion of the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. In the procreation and education of children, it reflects the Father's work of creation. It is called to partake of the prayer and sacrifice of Christ. Daily prayer and the reading of the Word of God strengthen it in charity. The Christian family has an evangelizing and missionary task. The relationships within the family bring an affinity of feelings, affections, and interests, arising above all from the members' respect for one another. The family is a privileged community called to achieve a sharing of thought and common deliberation by the spouses, as well as their eager cooperation as parents in the children's upbringing. The family and society. The family is the original cell of social life. It is the natural society in which husband and wife are called to give themselves in love and in the gift of life. Authority, stability, and a life of relationships within the family constitute the foundations for freedom, security, and fraternity within society. The family is the community in which, from childhood, one can learn moral values, begin to honor God, and make good use of freedom. Family life is an initiation into life in society. The family should live in such a way that its members learn to care and take responsibility for the young, the old, the sick, the handicapped, and the poor. There are many families who are at times incapable of providing this help. It devolves then on other persons, other families, and in a subsidiary way, society to provide for their needs. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unseen from the world. The family must be helped and defended by appropriate social measures. Where families cannot fulfill their responsibilities, other social bodies have the duty of helping them and of supporting the institution of the family. Following the principle of subsidiarity, larger communities should take care not to usurp the family's prerogatives or interfere in its life. The importance of the family for the life and well-being of society entails a particular responsibility for society to support and strengthen marriage in the family. Civil authority should consider it a grave duty to acknowledge the true nature of marriage in the family, to protect and foster them, to safeguard public morality and promote domestic prosperity. The political community has a duty to honor the family, to assist it and to ensure especially the freedom to establish a family, have children, and bring them up in keeping with the family's own moral and religious convictions. The protection of the stability of the marriage bond and the institution of the family, the freedom to profess one's faith, to hand it on, and raise one's children in it, with the necessary means and institutions. The right to private property, to free enterprise, to obtain work and housing, and the right to emigrate. In keeping with the country's institutions, the right to medical care, assistance for the aged, and family benefits. The protection of security and health, especially with respect to dangers like drugs, pornography, alcoholism, etc. The freedom to form associations with other families and so to have representation before civil authority. The fourth commandment illuminates other relationships in society. In our brothers and sisters, we see the children of our parents in our cousins, the descendants of our ancestors, in our fellow citizens, the children of our country, in the baptized, the children of our mother, the church, in every human person, a son or daughter of the one who wants to be called our father. In this way, our relationships with our neighbors are recognized as personal in character. The neighbor is not a unit in the human collective. He is someone who, by his known origins, deserves particular attention and respect. Human communities are made up of persons. Governing them well is not limited to guaranteeing rights and fulfilling duties such as honoring contracts. Right relations between employers and employees, between those who govern and citizens, presuppose a natural goodwill in keeping with the dignity of human persons concerned for justice and fraternity. The duties of family members. The duties of children. The divine fatherhood is the source of human fatherhood. This is the foundation of the honor owed to parents. The respect of children, whether minors or adults, for their father and mother is nourished by the natural affection born of the bond uniting them. 
It is required by God's commandment. Respect for parents, filial piety, derives from gratitude toward those who, by the gift of life, their love, and their work, have brought their children into the world and enabled them to grow in stature, wisdom, and grace. With all your heart, honor your father, and do not forget the birth pangs of your mother. Remember that through your parents you were born. What can you give back to them that equals their gift to you? Filial respect is shown by true docility and obedience. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. A wise son hears his father's father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. As long as a child lives at home with his parents, the child should obey his parents in all that they ask of him when it is good, when it is for his good or that of the family. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Children should also obey the reasonable directions of their teachers and all to whom their parents have entrusted them. But if a child is convinced in conscience that it would be morally wrong to obey a particular order, he must not do so. As they grow up, children should continue to respect their parents. They should anticipate their wishes, willingly seek their advice, and accept their just admonitions. Obedience toward parents ceases with the emancipation of the children, not so respect which is always owed to them. This respect has its roots in the fear of God, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The fourth commandment reminds grown children of their responsibilities toward their parents. As much as they can, they must give them material and moral support in old age and in times of illness, loneliness, or distress. Jesus recalls this duty of gratitude. For the Lord honored the father above the children, and he confirmed the right of the mother over her sons. Whoever honors his father atones for his sins, and whoever glorifies his mother is like one who lays up treasure. Whoever honors his father will be gladdened by his own children, and when he prays, he will be heard. Whoever glorifies his father will have long life, and whoever obeys the Lord will refresh his mother. O son, help your father in his old age, and do not grieve him as long as he lives. Even if he is lacking in understanding, show forbearance. In all your strength, do not despise him. Whoever forsakes his father is like a blasphemer and whoever angers his mother is cursed by the Lord. Filial respect promotes harmony in all of family life. It also concerns relationships between brothers and sisters. Respect towards parents fills the home with light and warmth. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. With all humility and meekness, with patience, support one another in charity. For Christians, a special gratitude is due to those from whom they have received the gift of faith the grace of baptism, and life in the church. These may include parents, grandparents, other members of the family, pastors, catechists, and other teachers or friends. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you. The duties of parents. The fecundity of conjugal love cannot be reduced solely to the procreation of children, but must extend to their moral education and their spiritual formation. The role of parents in education is of such importance that it is almost impossible to provide an adequate substitute. The right and the duty of parents to educate their children are primordial and inalienable. Parents must regard their children as children of God and respect them as human persons. Showing themselves obedient to the will of the Father in heaven, they educate their children to fulfill God's law. Parents have the first responsibility for the education of their children. They bear witness to this responsibility first by creating a home where tenderness, forgiveness, respect, fidelity, and disinterested service are the rule. The home is well suited for education in the virtues. This requires an apprenticeship in self-denial, sound judgment, and self-mastery, the preconditions of all true freedom. Parents should teach their children to subordinate the material and instinctual dimensions to interior and spiritual ones. Parents have a grave responsibility to give good example to their children. By knowing how to acknowledge their own failings to their children, parents will be better able to guide and correct them. He who loves his son will not spare the rod. He who disciplines his son will profit by him. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The home is the natural environment for initiating a human being into solidarity and communal responsibilities. Parents should teach children to avoid the compromising and degrading influences which threaten human societies. Through the grace of the sacrament of marriage, parents receive the responsibility and privilege of evangelizing their children. Parents should initiate their children at an early age into the mysteries of the faith of which they are the first heralds for their children. They should associate them from their tenderest years with the life of the church. A wholesome family life can foster interior dispositions that are a genuine preparation for a living faith and remain a support for it throughout one's life. Education in the faith by the parents should begin in the child's earliest years. This already happens when family members help one another to grow in faith by the witness of a Christian life in keeping with the gospel. Family catechesis precedes, accompanies, and enriches other forms of instruction in the faith. Parents have the mission of teaching their children to pray and to discover their vocation as children of God. The parish is the Eucharistic community and the heart of the liturgical life of Christian families. It is a privileged place for the catechesis of children and parents. Children, in turn, contribute to the growth and holiness of their parents. Each and every one should be generous and tireless in forgiving one another for offenses, quarrels, injustices, and neglect. Mutual affection suggests this. The charity of Christ demands it. Parents' respect and affection are expressed by the care and attention they devote to bringing up their young children and providing for their physical and spiritual needs. As the children grow up, the same respect and devotion lead parents to educate them in the right use of their reason and freedom. As those first responsible for the education of their children, parents have the right to choose a school for them, which corresponds to their own convictions. This right is fundamental. As far as possible, parents have the duty of choosing schools that will best help them in their task as Christian educators. Public authorities have the duty of guaranteeing this parental right and of ensuring the concrete conditions for its exercise. When they become adults, children have the right and duty to choose their profession and state of life. They should assume their new responsibilities within a trusting relationship with their parents, willingly asking and receiving their advice and counsel. Parents should be careful not to exert pressure on their children, either in the choice of a profession or in that of a spouse. This necessary restraint does not prevent them, quite the contrary, from giving their children judici judicious advice particularly when they are planning to start a family. Some forego marriage in order to care for their parents or brothers and sisters, to give themselves more completely to a, prof to a profession, or to serve other honorable ends. They can contribute greatly to the good of the human family. This brings us to the end of our reading selection, the end of our episode. Thanks for joining me for this abbreviated episode. Uh, between this week and next week's episode, please pray for me. I'll be praying for you. And in the meantime, God bless you. Thanks for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your family and your friends, and connect with me through Facebook and Instagram. I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, God bless you.